Welcome back to the Totem Confidence Podcast. Super, super excited to speak with someone who I had the pleasure of meeting briefly in San Francisco, California this summer at the International Enneagram Association Global Conference. Got to take a picture with her and Russ Hudson, someone who I have a bunch of her books. And so it's just amazing to finally talk to. I'm here with the one and only Ginger Lapid Bogda, the author of nine books. Some of who I, some of them I have right here, bringing out the best in yourself at work, the art of typing, bringing out the best of everyone you coach, and many, many more. Welcome to Total Confidence Podcast, Ginger Lapid Bogda. How are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? I am well, well, super, super excited to speak good. with you. I've been looking um, to this too. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I'm going to ask you a question I heard, and I'm going to phrase it the way I heard you say it before. Mm. I, I hope I'm saying it the right way. I heard you say it. You said you don't discover the Enneagram. Yeah. The Enneagram finds you. Yes. How did the Enneagram find you? And what was your first impression of it when it did find you? So can I just say one thing first before sure. where I got that? Because I, you know, I think there's something to the reason I said the Enneagram finds you, you know, you don't find it. So I work in the professional arena with not just, I work directly with organizations, profits, not for profits, but I also do a lot of um, training of Enneagram professionals who want to teach, coach, train, consult with the Enneagram. So I get a, you know, and I have worked all over the world with this. So, you know, I get a sort of an over, and I've been doing this for that kind of work for over 25 years. So there's a lot of data points, right? And I have a really good memory, which was probably a thing that annoyed both of my ex-husbands the most. <laughs> so, so one of the things that I had noticed, and it wasn't that too far into this, was that most of the people who would come to my programs who were really sincerely wanting to learn the Enneagram, work with it, et cetera. And there were some people whose original, this is happening less and less, but still were like, well, how can I use the Enneagram? How much money can I charge or make from working, offering services with the Enneagram? And it was like a sense of the people that were looking to how to use, how they could use the Enneagram as opposed to people who came to sincerely want to know how to trend, work with the Enneagram to bring it out. Those people that were more how to use the Enneagram in that sense, use in that sense, not utilize, but use, they were usually very successful. They wanted to learn it fast. They wanted it quick. They wanted to monetize it. They wanted to know how to like that. And they just weren't really, hadn't, didn't, weren't integrating the Enneagram into them. And what I did find was that the people that were really sincerely committed to understanding the Enneagram, they all had a story around how the Enneagram found them. You know, and sometimes it was they'd learned it years earlier a little bit, but they'd put it away. And then all of a sudden, bang. Or, um, they had a certain point in their life where there was something they were challenged with and somebody just suggested the Enneagram and they, and all of a sudden it went clicked. Sometimes they would say, it was, often came in threes, you know, they would hear the Enneagram from this person, they'd hear, see something about the Enneagram in that setting, and then there was a third and they go, okay, I guess I'm supposed to explore this. So, so that's why I say the Enneagram finds you and then if you work, understand it that way and you embrace the Enneagram way, then it's like what you're going to actually be doing with the Enneagram as it works through you. What is the your particular way that you're going to be working with the Enneagram? It's going to be, it's almost like it uses us instead of we use it mm. in that sense, you know? So obviously you found some calling in podcasting, right? Yeah. That's why I have to, you know, I've, okay. So back, to, so to your question, how did, the Enneagram find me. Okay. So, hmm. so when I was in my late thirties, I, I had a, a 
couple of people that I knew from college, university, or that they had actually gone to Eureka, the original Eureka program down in you know South America, Chile. And they came back and they were talking about it, but it didn't, it didn't, this is like, gosh, I wasn't that old. It didn't click with me like, oh, I want to learn this, right? Or I want to know this, or I want to this, this, right? And I had had a, a strong attachment because I went to college at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and I had a lot of friends in the Bay Area. It, you know, it, it, Still, I had lived in the Bay Area, even during, but it never, I don't know, even in Berkeley, I was living in Berkeley. That's with the hotbed during that era, but it mm -hmm. never sort of came to me that way. I should have, could have, why didn't it, you know? But then mm -hmm. when I was in my 40s, I was, I was already, a, you know, a trained coach, a trained trainer, a, a consultant. I was an OD consultant. I had, a you know, a lot of experience and, hmm. There's a growth center that you might have heard of called Esalen that's uh, in Big Sur, California. It was where Claudio and the original group kind of got together and then went down to Chile to Rica, right? So I had been, um, I was trained as a Gestalt therapist prior to that time. And I had worked at Esalen, not as a uh, trainer, but it was kind of, I was a gate guard, right? I, but I really had a lot of friends there and et cetera. So once I, that was in my late twenties, so in, I had always gone back there for different kinds of programs because they have really good programs and they have wonderful food and it's residential and it's beautiful. And all right. So I was just wanting to do something to relax. And I was, I was wanted to go to Esalen. So I looked at their catalog of courses. And because I had been through just about almost every growth and spiritual thing that had been offered at that time space. I, the Enneagram popped out at me during the time I was free. It was a window and I didn't know anything about it. So, and it was being taught by Helen Palmer and I didn't know anything about her. But I decided, which I always did, I would go to up to Esalen, I'd go to a program. If I didn't like the program, I didn't have to, I could just sit on a hill, you know, and and or sit in the in the the communal um, space with food and have you know granola or something. So I go, and it's billed as an a beginning course. I'm fine. I'm beginner. You have to read this book. All right. Now you'll think this is funny because I think it's funny. Maybe you won't. But so I get into the meeting room and it's all like it's being held in this place called the Roundhouse where Fitz Pearls used to do his. He was the father of Gestalt training he used to do his work there and it's really high up on the hill and there's pillows all against the wall so it's very cool and then i'm sitting there reading this book and somebody i'm sitting on the wall so i'm on the floor this woman comes in and she comes over to me she's standing above me and she reaches her hand out and she says i don't know who you are but i like you mm. and i'm like Okay, this is already a little strange, but it turned out to be Helen Palmer. So then I go into the program starts and it turns out it's an advanced program. It was mismarked. So I'm one of the few people out of 40 that doesn't know anything. So I'm scrambling. So at first it's sounding like numbers being thrown. I'm this, I'm this, I'm that. And I'm like, okay, this isn't for me because I don't, I'm not a very, I'm a con non-conventional, conventional person. Like, I like to do things in a classical way and in a really good way. Like, if I even make a recipe food, I'll follow the recipe usually and then I'll change it. But I like to know how it's supposed to taste. And if I can tell by the recipe, but I can sometimes, hey, yeah, it needs a little more of this or you could add that. I do that. But, and then I just, do what I want. Okay. So I'm in this program and I go, okay, I paid for this. I'm not liking this too much. <laughs> I'm feeling it's a lot of anxiety in me. I'm feeling anxious because I'm a newbie, newbie right? <laughs> but I paid my money. So maybe I should stay <laughs> five days. <laughs> so that's, 
Enneagram found me. And then after day and day four, I thought, well, this is really good. But I always went from my own. I'm just going on a vacation. You see how innocently look at me where I am. Uh, I wasn't yeah. paying for anything other than just like a vacation or once I get into a personal growth. So then two things happen. One is um, after the program was over, I go outside. I'm one of the last to leave the room. And I see this uh, dirigible or blimp in my, but it's not really there, but it's in my mind. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, your job is to bring the Enneagram out more into the world. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, and then I say, well, that's not my plan. And it came back a second time, said it doesn't matter what your plan is. Mm -hmm. I didn't really have a plan, but that certainly wasn't anything in my horizon, right? So I said, well, what am I supposed to do? And the third time it came back and said, just be still, it'll be clear. Oh. So then I thought, well, okay, I like this I, for my own growth. I'm going to go. And since I started with Helen, you know, and Helen, I don't know if you ever got a chance to meet Helen, but Helen's very quirky, you know, and she's, and she's a really good teacher. So she's sort of, reti she's retired now, but so I mm -hmm. went to the training program that she and David Daniels were doing. Mm -hmm. Um, as a way. And then as part of my training, I had to type 20 people. That was then their program. And 10 of them had to be supervised, but you know, you recorded them on a tape recorder, this is pre-video. Mm. And I had just had recently moved to Los Angeles. So I didn't really have, you know, 20 people there, you know? And so I started, uh, typing my, my clients, mm. my, you know, so I had a lot of clients, so I was typing them and then I would give them Helen's book as a thank you. And then they would say, well, can you help me work? This would be good. Let's bring it to the team. Right. So that's how I started to do, you know, it was working through me, but it was never part of a plan I had to do mm. anything organizationally with it, but it was pretty clear. That's what I was supposed to do. You see? Wow. Wow. That that's that's amazing. Yeah, and amazing. I see why you say that now. Why, why how I it finds you. So so then, so here's funny. So like I sell um Enneagram training tools that are full color. You may have seen them, typing cards and all kinds mm -hmm. of them. Okay. And at that point, so I had some clients and I had these rudimentary tools. So there was an IEA conference, an early one. And I had been to some of the earlier ones than that. And one of the things that struck me was how often people were teaching the Enneagram through lecture when you had real people in the room. Like, why should I tell you everything you need to know about your type? Because I don't know everything you need to know anyway. Plus, you know, it's like when I have you there, if I explain enough of it to you, when you get your type, I can ask you about it. Uh, yeah. So what I mean? So, but it wasn't, and I did do type panels, but which I was trained to do, but also interactive activities. So I decided to put in a proposal for how to teach the Enneagram interactively. Now at this point, I wasn't, I was just sort of a no, no nobody knew anything about me, but I had been trained a lot and I'm a PhD in education. I taught, I know instructional design. I, I thought, so but nobody knows that and I don't really care, but I was like, okay, let's get interactive people. So I did it, uh, the session, and I had um, like almost three quarters of the whole conference there. Like that was pretty amazing. And then I had just come from a client and I had some of my very rudimentary training tools hmm. with, me. so people said, well, what do you use? But so I showed them a few, so then it was over. So then after the session, I got bombarded. People just sort of came up to the podium. Can I buy these tools? And I, mm. I wasn't selling them. I had no idea what to charge. I wasn't in, that wasn't, but I was like, I felt like a belly dancer, you know, where you, like, <laughs> you belly dance, but you know, belly dancers, they dance and then people put money in their pocket. And, <laughs> uh, I said, okay, well, I, how about this? And people were just stuffing my pocket with money and it wasn't the money. It was like, okay, I guess there's a need for this. Yeah. And that's the need to help people learn how to teach the Enneagram in interactive ways, not just lecture only or not just type panels only. I don't mean lecture is helpful, 
tag panels are really helpful. I don't, that's, but there's more to it than that. So that's sort of how I came to this. And then I've written these books like, well, there needs to be a book on how to apply it, the basics. I mean, Michael Goldberg wrote a really good book, what, you know, getting your boss's number, it had a, the two titles to it. And it was really good descriptive, but it wasn't so like, okay, activity-based, you know? So I was like, I had this background and this is how you put it into action. So that was my first book that you, the bringing out the best in yourself at work. And oh, every book has just followed that. Sort of like, is there a need for this? You know, can I, is there a need I can fill and want to? So I write these books and, you know, write a lot of books, but writing isn't my thing that I love, really. I just do it as a serve. It feels more like a service to the Enneagram or something, but that's through me, right? It's like the Enneagram through me. Your book, um, I'm glad you brought up your book. Um, was that the first book? Did I read somewhere? I was just making sure that I'm not um, making up stuff, but bringing out the best in yourself at work. at work. Was that the first book endorsed by Claudio Naranjo? Yeah. W uh, how did that come about? Because I, I, you know, I, I'm learning the history, and I know he wasn't very keen on uh, putting it out the way the Enneagram had become out in the, in the public oh, like that. Yeah. yeah. Are you asking why did he endorse my book? Yes. That is a good question. You're on that. I've been on a number of podcasts. You know, nobody's asked me that question. But there's a that is a that's a question I really want to answer. Okay. So Claudio had never endorsed an Enneagram book prior to mine. Okay. So now I met Claudio because I was on the IEA board and I was the conference co-chair in 2000, the early 2000s. And then and Judith Searle was my other co-chair. And we were trying, and it was going to be in Santa Monica because we both lived there. So we said, well, we want to have a really great conference. We need a really good keynoter and a really good endnoter. So what we did was we sat at lunch and we said, who do we want? We said, let's ask Claudio. Now, she knew him. I didn't. Mm. And the prevailing thought was, A, he would never come. Okay. But we said we should ask anyway. <laughs> so we asked and he said yes wow and why he hadn't come was because he had never been asked to be a keynoter wow 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 <laughs> he would have come if he was given yeah but there was also some stuff in the underground community at the time where they didn't really want some people didn't want him there i mean a lot of people really did, okay <clears throat> so they were <clears throat> well Judith and I didn't care we just in fact I got yelled at by some people <laughs> I, yelled at. I remember getting yelled at by somebody I will not say who it was but how dare you invite Claudio yeah, and I'm like pulling the phone you know like so far away from my ear <laughs> and then the person was like I just let them yell at me and then they said, you know, I really like working with you because you're, you can deal with conflict or something. And I'm like, oh, I'm thinking little thought bubble. You should see what I'm doing, you know, yeah. but, but there was controversy around this. So, but that gets into why did Claudio endorse my book? Okay. So Claudio comes in the IEA. We treated him to a, uh, and some people he brought to a dinner at a, that point, in Santa Monica, I was, my ex-husband was a member of the beach club and it was right on. So we said, well, and they had good food and it was fair, really good pricing, right? Because So we treated him, we had a board and him there. So I, that's where I met him. Now, at this dinner that I was kind of hosting, but not so, sort of hosting, yeah. Okay, so I didn't drive him to this dinner, but the the car that drove him broke down. So he ended up getting to the dinner, but he needed a ride back. So, and this, he asked me, you know, or somehow I ended up being the ride back. Okay. Mm. So we're driving along. It's not very long. And he says to me, 
how do people now he's very bilingual he's sp spanish speaking perfect english takes you know he was a renaissance man so he says how do you people feel about my coming here being thing? and i said this is where you know you, i guess somebody told you i was honest person yes I don't, yeah I don't know. Like, so I just, I tell them what I think. And I said, well, there will be some people that would prefer that you weren't here. Mm. But most of the people here will be quite happy and some thrilled that you're here. Yeah. So the people that are not happy about it, they aren't going to say anything that, and they'll, if they, they will not be upfront, you know, so you don't need to worry about that, but there will be that. And I'm, we're aware of it, but that's okay. We're, we want you here. Okay. Now that, he said, you know, I asked somebody else the question and they told me, oh, everybody's so excited. He said, but I knew that wasn't true, but you told me the truth. Mm. It's like, oh. So then, so Claudio took a, um, a liking to me because he saw me as a truthful person. Now, now, at that point, he didn't know I had a Gestalt background. He was the master Gestalt person. He was supposed to be the next coming of Fritz Perls until he found the Enneagram. And then that was the end of that. But so, you know, it's like he and I had a, I mean, I was never as proficient as he was, right? But it's a, it's a mindset, the Gestalt way of thinking. And I was trained by really good people and I was real proficient in it, but I'm glad I was the master. So we had a lot more in common in terms of our orientation to even doing some of the Sometimes people see some of the work I do and they'll go, oh, you learned this from Claudio. It's like, no, it's it's a gestalt way of handling these kinds of things. All right. So then the IA board decided since it was really nice to have Claudio there and he stayed the whole time. And then what happened is the board decided that they would want, and this during the conference, would Claudio come back the next year and do a pre-conference? of on subtypes because he was the mm. holder of the most of the really good information on subtypes mm. and they decided that i should be the one to ask him <laughs> <laughs> because he took a liking to me because i was honest you see the whole thing just started with this being honest yeah forthright so then and i didn't want anything bloody i was a little anxious around him but I had read a lot of his work, but I wasn't like, oh, Claudio. <laughs> you know, it was just like, okay. So then, so, and then they put another person with me who was from Italy because they thought the multinational who's on the board. So he and I went and talked to Claudio. And, and really, I did most of the talking because I did. And I negotiated with Claudio to come to the next year and bring 27 people with them, one of each subtype to work mm. with us. And, you know, we negotiated. I remember that was kind of fun. And then Andrea Isaacs was on the board at the time. So then we handed that off to the actual logistics of it to Andrea, but I did the, uh, you know, the, the agreement, if you will. Okay. So I do that. And he did a special thing. It was really cool. So I had a lot more exposure to him that next year. So then when I wrote my book, now, see, if you get this, see, because I have a Gestalt background, he has a Gestalt background. If, if you have that background and you read my book, you'll see why I do certain things in that book. But if you don't have a Gestalt background, you wouldn't. Okay. Mm -hmm. But he could pick that up. Well, so I decided to ask for endorsements, right, after I'd written his book. And I made a list and I had, I thought about him and he said, oh, he's never going to endorse my book. And I thought, well, you know what? He isn't, but I really do respect his work and let him, let me deal with the rejection of him not liking the book or saying he won't even look at it. I'm a big girl, you know, <laughs> I just handled that. But if, I just thought out of respect for him who he was and his work, I would ask. Yeah. You know, so I figured I could, I totally expected, okay, what did I get back? But an endorsement and some funny, uh, what's, and was even, it was the email he sent that was even more fun than the endorsement, which was 
this. Um, I think this is a, something like, I think this is a really good book. Um, I particularly like the chapter on conflict with the pinches and crunches, because I think that can take people even further with it. It's like really opens the door to understanding. Because the whole thing with the pinches and crunches is it's not just about what your triggers are and what causes you conflict, but it's that's a, a window into your self-development work. Because hmm. that's your trigger. So it, you, we tend to think it's about the other person. Because you know, I got triggered because you did that. But actually, if you take responsibility for yourself, you see, it's my trigger. How does that relate to my type? And that's what that chapter is about. And that's why I'm saying that's a very gestalt way of understanding this. Oh. That's what he got. And then he said, the only thing I take issue with is referring to the type two as the helper. Or the giver or something. And I'm like, I'm racking my brain like. I read my book over and over again to see what that was, but he still endorsed it, right? Yeah. It was in a little picture which says some different authors give different labels to these different types. And I have this like four labels for each type that different authors give. So I personally didn't actually refer to it as the giver or helper. It was just saying that, you know, that was the label that often people get, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but he picked that up. Do you mean do you know what is the level at which he scrutinized that book to pick that up? Wow. Wow. Yeah. It's a small little word on a little graphic. I mean, a lot of people skip over the, you know, things he knows the underground. Why would he read it in that level of detail? But he did. So, but I, I never use the word giver or helper for the type two anyway. And the reason he said that is he, because he, he said, and I, I totally agree with him, it gets the two out of the responsibility that there's a giving to get. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Totally agreed with two. So, so anyway, so that's my story. That's it. It's a really, it's a really a window into maybe me, into Claudio, into the history of the Enneagram, more modern, his relationship to the IEA. I, I, I you know, I'm a, I lead with a type five energy. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things, that stuck out to me was we do want to be invited. We act mm -hmm. like we're above it, but we really do want to be asked. Yeah. And so the fact that you asked him and included him and then were, was honest with him, mm -hmm. um, we don't relish in being outcast for real. You know, it's right. just kind of like we accept that. So that just, that just hit home with me, just kind of leading with the same energy. Mm -hmm. Um I want to go back a little bit. Um, first of all, that was a fascinating story. I appreciate you sharing that in the detail. I'm I'm really intrigued with the history um, early on as far as establishing in America. So thank you. Thank you for taking the time to share that with me. Um, you spoke about that you were already working with organizations prior to um, the Enneagram finding you. Mm -hmm. So that was a natural thing for you to bring mm -hmm. something that you learned that was useful into mm -hmm. what you were already doing. Um, what, was there a fear that the Enneagram was a little too esoteric? Cause you're dealing with two different uh, areas, business, and then you're dealing with the Enneagram, this thing with this weird sig this red symbol. Um, was there ever any trepidation on your on your part of well, are people going to misunderstand this? They're going to think I'm out of here, out of there. Like when you initially started bringing it into organizations. Well, so your question has me going into sort of three or four different areas. So one area is, I would have to say the basic answer is no. It was early on, though, so, you know, that could, could be. But see, at that time, I, and I think I wasn't the only consultant trainer who was in this position. I already had clients that trusted me. Wow. So if I said something might be useful, they would often be willing to try it. And that's how, in the early stages, the Enneagram got brought into organizations. The second, remember that I typed a number of my clients as part of my training which they were willing to do because I asked them and they thought it would be interesting. And then I gave them a book and then, we, so then there was that. So that there wasn't that, you know, they weren't resisting. And then I was always like linking 
and I still do, you know, when I work with an organization, what is it you're trying to accomplish by bringing the Enneagram in? Because the Enneagram by itself, if you, what's the organizational challenge you're having that the Enneagram can be useful in? And then I would integrate it always the Enneagram with what some behavioral science model or process that would work really well that always did, but the Enneagram made it even more so, it was stronger. So I didn't, I mean, there were companies, but that would maybe if I broaden this out, we did a bench, my, I have a network, the Enneagram and Business Network that I started, I think 2009. And there's you know, not always the same 70s, about 70 people, professionals, two tiers, uh, senior and associates and the associates have a senior mentor and I mentor the seniors and it's a development network essentially. And it, cr I created it because people were asking if they had to work with me and I just didn't know how to, you know, it's like, I don't have that much bandwidth. I'm, just, you know, it's just me, right? Or mentor, it's like, how do I do that? Which is also why the train trainer programs that I do. But so I'm like, um, at that point in time, the people that were using the Enneagram organization, a lot of them already had clients that they were working with. But this, we did a benchmark study in 2011, and we did interviews, in-depth interviews with over 70 consultants and leaders about how to bring the Enneagram in. And, you know, we found a lot of good things, but essentially the Enneagram was early use which is where people are willing to take the risk. They're the innovators. You know, there's stages of innovation. So the innovators would bring it in. And usually it wasn't human resources that was bringing it in sometimes, but often it was a leader who had been exposed to the Enneagram somehow. Mm -hmm. um, or a consultant that the leader, the organization worked with and they trusted the consultant or the trainer and it's just, and then it started to take hold. And you could, it's now expanded, you know, quite dramatically over 20 years. Wow. Um, have you ever encountered a situation where somebody's just so skeptical, uh, especially like doing a presentation? Um, and how do you, if, if so, how do you handle that? like somebody that's in a key position and they're just so skeptical because maybe they're so closed-minded. Yeah, that happens. Um, I wish I could say it's never happened to me. You know, typically uh, when I get brought in, I'm working with the, the that key person who's bringing me in. So that is not an issue because they're already wanting it. What can be an issue though is if there's another person in this say group or the team who is a dominant personality mm -hmm. and really doesn't like it and the leader isn't uh, uh, well respected or strong enough, mm -hmm. that person can push back and they'll try sometimes push back on, I've had that happen once where they push back on me where they really trying to push back on the leader. Mm -hmm. It was easier to push back on me and the Enneagram than to push back on the leader. That I've had that happen. Um, now, sometimes people are skeptical and they're not, it's not because of this agenda. You know, if there's a power influence agenda and there's something like that, okay. You know, the person just doesn't like this kind of work or whatever. But sometimes people are just skeptical because they're naturally curious and skeptical. And, you know, being able to differentiate that, not react to it. Like I like people that are skeptical of it. Because I was skeptical. Remember my Esalen story? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. <laughs> so I say, like, bring it on, you know? And if they're skeptical, I want to know why. And then I'll say, that's fine. I was skeptical, probably as much, could even possible. Just, you know, give it a little time. And then at the end of the, you know, session, let's see where you sit with it. You can make your own decision about it. I mean, that's basically my position. That doesn't work with somebody who is um, opposing it because they just, or it's a power trip or a power mm -hmm. wants something brought in or they don't believe in anything that relates to psychology or, you know. But even I've had people in groups where they, um, well, they 
it's like they think it's like they've gone on the internet and they've seen it looks like the occult and they're <laughs> bad. And how do how do you convince them it's not the occult? You know, but but I want to know what they're thinking about because I'll have them say it and I'll go, you know, there's a lot of junk out there on the internet. And the Enneagram isn't the occult, but just give it a chance. It's very practical. You'll see. But you see, one of the things that I've done some early, I don't people, I don't think have said this recently, but that they I used to be described as someone who translated esoteric in the Enneagram into practical words, usable words without uh, diluting the meaning. So if you look at my materials or even look at my books, which the materials match the books in a lot of ways, you know, what does it mean to um, you take the higher states, right? What is envy? You know, it's like I can tell you in two sentences what envy is. And I'm not taking it from the dictionary. Or what is avarice, you know, because you can go to a whole esoteric and think about avarice, but what does it really mean? Can I explain this to you so that a reasonably interested, intelligent enough person can understand it? And so, I, you know, I've spent a lot of time in the books and what does this really mean? What is this, you know, and how do I communicate it? So that's been something that matters to me. I think that's probably one of the ways I feel like I've contributed is to bring it down to an understandable level. I'm not really, I don't like psychobabble myself anyway. Yeah. You know, or spiritual babble. I mean, it's just in general. I think if there's something that I can learn and understand, I don't, it feels a little bit too ambiguous for me. So. Makes sense. Um, what is, have you ever encountered a situation going into an organization where the culture is just so toxic? I know people throw that word toxic around so much. I don't like the word myself, but for lack of a better word, um, where you just kind of like, you know what? Mm, this is not for me. Have you ever encountered situations like that? Yeah, it's not that common. You know, I'll just say for, so I did go into one, this is like, I mean, I've been doing this for many years. So if I'm talking about this, it's the exception, absolute exception. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So, and I have to be really careful in what I say. Okay. So, so this one client I went into and I didn't know much about them, but so it's an industry that's very safety oriented. I have to be vague and okay. very careful. I understand. Okay. So they're safety oriented. So I get there and I, you know, this just tells you a lot. I mean, I think sometimes you just don't know until you know, but it's the exception. So I get there and it's 12 noon and the session starts at one. And I've flown there. So I'm just come from the airport. I'm starving. And they have me sitting in the lobby for an hour, even though they knew I was coming at noon. And just at that point, I started to little ideas came to my head. I said, I wonder what this place is really like. Like, I would really like to go to lunchroom. I'm not looking for somebody. I just want to buy a sandwich or pizza. Or I need yeah. something. Maybe they'll have food in the meeting room. Mm. I couldn't even ask anybody. So I'm sitting there starving, right? So I'm one of these people, when I get hungry, I really need to have something. It doesn't even have to be a lot, even crackers, you know, anything. So I get into the room and there's no food and there's no time for me to get food. Mm. And the fun, the session, I get told that they have to spend the first 40 minutes of a half an it's a half day session on the Enneagram. They have to do a check-in and this is what their check-in does. So, oh, and they have to tape everything on the floor, all the wires. So nobody trips like, like every super taping things down, which is not a bad idea, but it was like over taped. 
And then what is, they're going to lead at the session. They do a safety check. There's like 10, 12 people in the room. Everybody has to tell, share their best safety moment since the last time they met. Now, I'm like, what is this? Like, but still, I'm still. <laughs> so what they're sharing is uh, I had a, forgot my helmet when I went onto the thing, but somebody lent me theirs. And okay, they're sharing these moments, but I swear they're almost, several of them were in tears over stories like this. <laughs> I'm like, okay, how, why are they getting so emotional over these stories? Like, this is not, like I saved somebody from, I can get emotional, right? I'm not, but they just didn't seem like big deal. <laughs> and this is how they're spending their time. So then, so now my time's cut down. So now, and in this case, they had a nine leader who I talked to was lovely, but she wasn't very assertive. Yeah. And some nines can be very assertive when they get, you know, but she hadn't gotten to that place in her life. And so I'm teaching it. And then there's this pair there. And the man is an eight and the woman is a one. Mm. And they're talking, non they're just participants, but they're just talking nonstop while I'm talking. And I see what this is because he's like, you know, the, they're like trying to distract from the program. And then they'll come in and say, ask me a question. And I just answered the question. So I'm now repeating what I've just said to the whole group. And this is getting on. So obviously I, Funny said, look, I you know I don't know what to do here, but you know, so that didn't really stop them. But it wasn't, I think, a very effective session because it felt like it was a very toxic environment where it's a very passive aggressive way of taking shots at the leader, asserting their power and dominance mm -hmm. in a paired, not sort of a little cowardly too, you know? It's like they didn't yeah. even couldn't even do it and sabotaging the experience for other people there who wanted to learn. Right. That happened. I couldn't do anything about it. I tried. I mean, there maybe I've thought about that. I'm still, that was years ago, but like, what would I have done differently? You know, I asked a lot of the questions going in, but nobody told me about this dynamic. I think they were wanting the Instagram to help people stop that stuff, but Sometimes they don't even know how to name it or they don't, you know? So anyways, things like that can happen, but it's not the norm. I appreciate you sharing that. That's um, because a lot of times these experiences you have to build off of, you need these um, mm -hmm. you, negative because every experience is not going to be positive. So I appreciate you sharing that. Um, mm -hmm. I want to talk about coaching and in your book, the in, in the introduction of your book, bringing out the best in everyone you coach, mm -hmm. you said with the proliferation of coaches worldwide, it's important to understand what coaching is, how it works okay. and how to ensure that it actually produces results. I, there are so many people calling themselves coaches. Um, mm -hmm. There are online courses. You can just sit through a course and call yourself a coach. So in a very basic way what is the your definition of uh, a coach well there's a role of coach and then there's ethics of coaching well uh, there's a role there's operating practices there's ethics that go with it and there's training people should have right <clears throat> so the problem is yes anybody they don't even have to go through any training they can just say they're a coach because yeah what are they actually doing? Are they just telling people what they think? Are they just listening to people? Um, what are they doing, you know? So a, a coach is someone who has a role to guide and support and help someone else with certain areas of their, we call it goals, right? Mm -hmm. Intentions, goals, that there's a, an agreement that you're going to help them with a specific to achieve if you can certain goals and things. And so the process is sort of the coach provides the process for that. And it's an ongoing thing. It's not a one-off. 
and the client is responsible for the progress. Mm -hmm. So, and then in the role, it's like, you know, just for example, should, can you, can you coach your kids? No. Now, as an, as a verb, you can coach your kids. Mm -hmm. As a noun, you're not your kid's coach and you shouldn't be. You're their dad. Yeah. And there's a role that goes with dad that isn't the same as the role that goes with coach. The coach does not have an, any agenda whatsoever for the client, except that the client makes progress if they can, but they are doing all the thinking through. And the coach asks a lot of questions, re, you know, gives feedback. There's a lot of techniques involved, you know, does um, maybe takes them on a guided imagery, you know, mm -hmm. offers some feedback that's not advice, but, you know, but is feedback around something. But that's not what dads do or moms. Yeah. You know, they might listen and you can say, hey, that's going to get you in trouble if you do that. This is what I would do, maybe. Or do you want to hear what I would do? I mean, that's what parents do, right? Yeah. 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 It's not what a coach does. And if the client says, well, what would you do, coach? The coach would say, I want to hear first what you would do and what you yeah. think different paths are it's a whole different approach it takes a lot of discipline it takes skills um it takes staying in role should you be coaching friends no mm -hmm. as a verb you can as a noun no because the relationship or the role of the friend you're supposed to support the person you're supposed to you know and friends you know the confidentiality boundaries are different so for example, in this year of five, so I know you have like strong boundaries around confidentiality, but absolutely the coaching role, the coach is supposed to be as close to absolutely confidential as possible. Mm -hmm. So which while well, coaches don't, but as soon as you do, you're transgressing and violating and hurting trust. Friends, now just if you take, you know, say you know, your friends you probably expect confidentiality from, right? But I don't. And if I find out they've said something that I wish they hadn't, I go, I wish I'd told them not to say that. And then I'll talk to them. Why did you say that? But friends are, you know, might share something with another. Yeah. yeah. Not out of bounds, but it would be if you were the coach. Oh, I see. Not yeah. okay. Right? Totally not okay. You know, here's another great example. So suppose you have two friends and one thinks they're coaching you when you're talking to them and another friend's, I'm really worried about, so, you know, because I, the, then the friend says, oh, that's okay because they're going through a hard time now. That's what friends do, right? But a coach should never do that. Shouldn't If the person were your coach, they would never say that you're going through a hard time, give them some space. Because you know... So you, it's a whole different role. Then the, and there's practices and ethics and and te, you know skills and training. But yeah, that's what I would say. That's a pretty good start, anyway. What what are the characteristics of a good coach? Let's say they they're adhering to those code of ethics and everything. What does a person? And I know these are very generic questions because you go really in depth in this book, um, bringing out mm -hmm. the best and the people you coach. Um, but just on a very basic level, what are some of the characteristics of a good coach? That you're able to help the client um, very early on establish what their coaching desires and intentions are. And that those are things that you think you can help them do. So your skill set, right, and attitude set and all that is you're aligned, that the match is good, but it's clear where you're going. And what clear about how often you're going to be clarity being clear about the parameters. How often are you going to meet? What's the structure? If there's money involved, what's that? <laughs> How is that done? Um, also, the third thing would be being able to develop rapport because your client needs to trust you and feel comfortable with you, right? So, and the coach's job is to help that happen. Hmm. And that requires a bit of versatility because different clients need different things, especially in the front end. And that has a lot to do with type, but not just, right? So if you have a client, this is an example, we'll keep type out of it. 
who's in a big crisis and is coming to you, they might be over trusting or under trusting, depending on when, right? You need to be tuned into that and be able to help them with that. So other things that make really great coaches, doing your own work. There's some, a lot of coaches get into, I'm better than you because I'm, I'm your coach. And that's not uh -huh. true. Mm -hmm. I'm more developed. I don't need to do much more development because I'm working with you and helping all these other people. You know, it's like the cobbler's children have no shoes and the accountants doesn't have their taxes in on time. And, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Coach needs to be really engaged in their own personal work so that they actually can help because you can't help somebody beyond what you've done yourself. Ooh. Yeah. yeah. Your self-development, your self-mastery. You can't. Plus, then there's always the issues of projection and transference and, you know, how you and being overreactive. You know, I had a coaching client. This is. And. I don't mean to say I'm so developed. I mean, I might be, I might not be. It's not the point, but. Mm -hmm. I just, and I really like working with her and I hadn't heard from her in a while, but she'd been sick and stuff. And so we got back together and she paid me in advance for reasons she wanted to, right? Mm -hmm. There's a reason that she needed, wanted to, it had to do with the cycle of the business and where she had money in the budget and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. not even the main point. But anyway, so I get with her and we're talking and all of a sudden I just kind of feel like she wants to be talking to me, but she doesn't really want coaching. Uh -oh. And it wasn't, see, now that situation, some coaches might take it personally. Like, oh, she doesn't want me to coach her anymore. Mm. My attitude is, I can feel there's a shift here. I can feel she doesn't really want coaching. I don't think it's personal. Could be. Let me ask and inquire. So I raised it with her. I said, let me ask you if this makes sense, you know, to continue coaching. And then what it turned out would be is, and I have to be careful because of confidentiality boundaries, of but there were two areas in her life, one personal and one professional that had been cost triggering her to go into coaching. Mm. And both we had worked with both of those really well. And that we'd had men, men, multiple, you know, I'd been coaching her for about three or four months every other week or every you know week or whatever. She'd made a lot of progress on that. And then what happened is both of those things changed. So she'd taken the learnings and worked with her type with that too. But the two personal and professional, both of those trigger situations changed so that they weren't triggers anymore. Mm. She just changed. I can't say what because of confidentiality. Of course. Of course. So now she's learned, got some good lessons from it. She's not getting triggered. And she got very interested in coaching. For, so she just took, she decided to go into a coaching program herself where she'd be trained as a coach. And in most coaching programs, you have to be coached too. Mm. So now she doesn't have the trigger event. She's learned all the lessons pretty much. I mean, and she's going through all this coaching and being coached herself in this program that she's happy with. I mean, you can get over coached. Uh, you see what I mean? Now I didn't, I just inquired about it. We, and she was so happy that I was raised it because she didn't want to disappoint me. And she didn't want me to think I didn't value. So we're figuring out how to spend the time now. And we've got some options. Mm -hmm. I've got the money. And for certain reasons, I can't return it to her. It's kind of a weird one, but okay. it's like I, she would be in a, I'm not in an ethical bind because I've accepted the money because she contracted for this, but I'm in a yeah. personal bind where I don't want to take money for work she hasn't used, right? Time. Right. But she's in an ethical bind because this is about the coaching. If I return the money to her, she's got to then give it back to the, Oh, I see. I see. She, because of the way it was... And she, that's not something that would get her in some hot water to say, you know, organizations are weird that way. So we've got to figure out a way to use the money because she, she's happy if I just keep it. I'm not. We've got to, we're figuring it out. But you see, that's just the, the role boundaries, but it's getting clear. And, you know, I didn't take it personally. I want to ask you as we bring it to a close, I'm very respectful of your time. Um, what drives you, you know, like what, 
what is the thing that motivates you? Because you've been doing this for a while and I'm sure mm-hmm. it's evolved over the time, but like what is the thing about your work that you love that it's like it feeds you? Well, you know, I think if you had asked me this 10 years ago, I might have a different answer and 10 years prior to that, a different answer and, you know, et cetera. So all I can really answer is what does that for, how, what feeds me now? What, you know, cause I have been thinking a lot about that. Um, so what, what does it, so what I get really charged up or excited about is I have this network, the Enneagram and Business Network that I mentioned, and it's like really helping them develop to be really great at what they do, greater and greater personal development, professional. We do programs, I mentor, you know, there's just a lot and they're doing great. And I'm really proud of what they do. And they're independent of me, you know, too. I mean, it's not like, so that, that. The other one is being really creative, uh, what sort of continuing to have offerings where I feel they're of value in the Enneagram or the Enneagram organizational world where I'm using my creativity. So it's like, cause I'm a pretty creative person. And so, and, and I like visuals too and metaphor and all that. So, you know, it's like, and I Gwen who works with as my creative, she's, we call her the creative director and ops manager, but she's very graphical. So we have fun working on stuff together and what might be writing using poetry or finding this or so it's like it's, it's just these multimodal things are kind of feed me you've worked with a lot of people and you mentioned mm-hmm. um helen palmer david daniels and one of your books you were talking about um don richard riso um what stands out to you as far as just I'll, I'll talk about these two people Helen Palmer and Rich, Don Richard Riso some of the things that you learned from them if you had to boil it down to right now I'm asking you just something that came from you from Helen Palmer that she shared with you and Don Richard Riso that just stuck with you over the years yeah that's easy actually because two things from one from each came so the one of the things from Helen was that that the nine, each of the nine types mimics, is a mimic for what they've were tuned into, but feel a loss of at the spiritual level. And it's a, the person, each of the types is a mimic, a poor mimic of that. And that because it's a mimic of that, and it's, you could, because you can only find what they're missing in this more spiritual or universal world, the mimicking actually takes them really far away further and further away. Mm-hmm. So for example, the one which is like holy perfection, right? So they try to make everything perfect, themselves, others, you know, their environments. And the more you're finding all these mistakes and everything, the more you get, move away from understanding that holy perfection is accepting this, that everything is perfect just as it is and the mm-hmm. flaws into that, you see? And so it's like that for each of the nine types. So that, and I teach that way and I think that way and I write that way. And I learned that really early on from Helen, and now from Don, because Don, I, I, he was, I was influenced by him theoretically, and I'd read all his books. But really, we were personal friends. We were mm-hmm. like the personal friends. There's a whole story there, but I won't, no time, and I wouldn't tell it anyway. But we used to talk on the phone. I mean, we would just chat about, you know, philosophy, enneagram. Uh, if there was some pricing of things going, you know, you know, you just name it, you know, it was, okay. so one of the things that he told me this, we were talking about, I was probably saying, Don, I'm concerned about this going on in the Enneagram community. It's one of those conversations, which were yeah. good either way. But he said to me, Ginger, don't worry about the Enneagram. It's more powerful than any of us. Mm. Mm. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. My final question to you, because I could actually talk to you probably for three hours, but I'm not. (laughs) Um, Hopefully we could talk again. But 
going and seeing the evolution of the Enneagram um, over the years, seeing the more, I guess, kind of seeing that it's become popular. And what would you say to the new people coming into the Enneagram who want to teach to, uh, as far as to how would you guide these new people to actually become quality teachers and not so much the because you see all types of articles the fly by night stuff the very superficial stuff um what would you say to people who are entering this work as far as teaching what would you what would be your guidance to them as far as to give quality uh service to the people who are there teaching i think it would be to ask that question of themselves how do i provide quality teaching to those whom I touch and to keep, and you know, there's a technique of what's the, it's a, a, it's a repeating question. How else do I add quality, right? Mm. How else, if you're not asking that question, you're not, doesn't matter what I say. And those are people that are using the Enneagram. You're not actually allowing the Enneagram to use them. They're using it for fun. They're using it for engagement with others. They're using it for, tripping out about how cool they are, right? Those are not, they're using it to make money if they can. They're using it to become famous. You know, I would say this about people that want to be famous in the Instagram. Do you realize that we are really in a small pond? Like, even if you're famous, so who, what does it really do for you to be famous in a small pond? Mm. First, you know? But I'm going to say, because I know your daughter, you said she's into K-pop. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to bring in K-pop and end on this one because it's funny. But BTS is like probably one of the most famous K-pop groups. And I don't know them personally. And I know, you know, all that. So, but they don't seem to be getting into any trouble. And they seem to be really good at what they do and all that. But the head of it, let me guess, RM. Okay he was interviewed with all the rest of them. He said, hey, so how do you guys stay grounded and not get your ego using, right? Because nobody's ever really choose them. You can see another. And he said, well, it's really simple. He said, 50% of our success is because of our fans. They call them, they call them the army, army. <laughs> That's 50%. Now there's seven of us. So each of us has 5%. That's 35, right? So you add 50 and so then you go up to um, 85. So the rest of it is our agency. So he said, I keep that in perspective. I only have 5%, only 5% of what's happening is because of my, me. So I can't get a big head about that. You know, it's like keeping it in perspective and not trying to get some other need met that isn't about really the pure Enneagram. It's like asking yourself, why am I doing this? What do I need to do? And even if you've been teaching it really for, you know, 15 years, what do I need to do to get better at this, to provide more? Now, it should be a question we, we continuously ask ourselves, mm. not just the people. Okay. That's beautiful. I it about that one. Bringing in BTS too, you know. <laughs> I love how you tied in from the beginning of our conversation to the end. Mm -hmm. It's been an honor and a pleasure to speak with you. I was telling Jason I was very nervous. I was probably more nervous speaking to you than anybody else. Why is that? that? I don't know. <laughs> um, I think just mm -hmm. because of this, the uh, you know, you do business and coaching and everything, and that's not a strong suit of mine. Maybe this is my five ego because I'm not mm -hmm. very uh, savvy when it comes to business. Okay. That might've been my five insecurity. I was super nervous speaking with you. So I appreciate how gracious you've been. And, um, and I just enjoy talking to you. I feel like just, it was a conversation. So it's beautiful. So your website is the Enneagram in business and you offer trainings, your books, um, and other resources. You have a newsletter and other things that are going on for those who are interested. Um, I thank you so much for coming thank on. It's been a pleasure. This is Total Confidence Podcast with Ginger Lathit Bogda. 
Samad Wazir, thank you so much. And we'll talk to you soon.